Yeah, thanks for joining us. We'll, we'll get underway. Um, we've, we've lost one of our farmers, but it's, he's wearing a collar. So, um, <laughs> we get hit. <laughs> um, yeah, cheers, Matt. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to have to hand, you, hand over to, uh, to Cine uh, from No Fence. She'll get you started, and I'm going to speak, and we're yeah, delighted to be joined by uh, Matt and David, um, two farmers that have been using the No Fence system this year, and they'll give you a bit of an insight as to uh, how and where they've been using it. So, yeah, um, we shall begin. Yeah, all right. Thank you, James. Uh, my name is Sin, and I'm the general manager of No Fence. Uh, and it's lovely to be here at Groundsman. I've seen a lot of you visit our stands for the past few days, which is lovely. Um, and yeah, I'm just I'm going to be trying to be very short because what I'm going to talk about is not as interesting as the guys behind me. Um, but uh, yeah, these are we're the ones here today. So it's me, and then it's James that some of you know from Precision Grazing, and then we got David over here. He's a farmer who's been using no fence now, and then. Last one's Matt Turner is also using collars and keeps getting lost <laughs> from the stage. All right, so we're going to run through. Just I'm going to give you a quick overview of No Fence and where we're from and what we're doing. Uh, and then we're going to run through. Then James is going to get over to sort of what his trials has been going on with. And then we're going to hear from our farmers. And then hopefully bit of product development, where are we going? And then lastly, some good questions we're hoping for. Um, so the new fence story, it starts with, uh, with our founder, which I, you know, if you get the chance to meet him, take it. Because uh, he's, I believe he's about to change the world with what he's doing with this technology, but he's the most down to earth person you'll ever meet. And he said in his youth, imagine a world without physical fences because he found them con containing and, and they were limiting the animals um, and they were a lot of work. He didn't like to do fencing. Um, so this is him and his herd of goats, which has been the guinea pigs, really, um, of the early stages of the product. Uh, and it's, you know, taken us to, to where we are today. So Oscar is, um, yeah, he didn't, I didn't think he imagined that we one day would do a presentation at Groundswell about the you know future tools of farming uh, enabling managed grazing, but here we are, which is really really nice. And No Fence has been developed by and for farmers. I have to, although there's no Norwegian farmer here today, huge thanks because they bought our prototypes four years ago, full price, all of that, and started using it, even though it fell apart didn't work well, but they have given us more than 15 million hours of grazing. And that's what you need when you're making a virtual fence, is you need the product to be on animals out grazing. And they've done that, and they've given us feedback. They've been patient, very patient. Um, and they've taken us where we are today. Um, so this is where, and you know, British farmers, like, this is... David's cows um, up there now. They're helping us improve now even better and to adapt the managed grazing system, which we are not very used to in Norway. In Norway, we're thinking, all right, I've got all this mountains and all this land that I want to fence off with because I want livestock on it, but I can't fence it. So then I use no fence. But in the UK, it's, you know, it's this whole movement of, of better grazing management. And uh, thanks to David we get the chance to develop something that he and other farmers might need and use. Um, so I'm going to run you through how it works. I know most, like, a lot of you have been to the stand and had this talk before. I apologize for that. Uh, but the no fence system is, so this is the collar, just so you get the cattle one, that goes around the neck of the animal. Um, and then when the animal gets crosses the boundaries, you draw virtual boundaries in or pastures in, in an app on your phone. And when the animal gets to, sorry. sorry about that. When the animal gets to the boundary, there is an audio cue, or a, we call it a melody. And that melody gets higher and higher in pitch as you move away from the boundary. And then if the animal don't turn around, they get a pulse. 
So the basic functionality of a virt our, our virtual fence compared to a standard electric fence is that the electric fence uses the vision of the cow. The cow can see the fence, turns around to avoid the pulse. We are swapping senses. So instead of using the eyes of the cow, we're using their very good listening skills. And then they learn, all right, there's an audio, I need to switch it off. In order to switch it off, I need to turn around. If not, I'm going to get a pulse. And animals are clever. They understand. And uh, I think the, my answer to this, when people question if we are, you know, the, how the system works and, you know, the animal welfare aspect of this, then I always say that because animals, because we can prove that animals are turning around on audio cues, that's why we're here. If they didn't, we couldn't be doing what we're doing. Uh, and then we always get asked, what happens if they escape? I'm going to run you through it quickly. It's not a very common thing to happen, let's put it that way, but there is a system for it. So as you can see, that process of audio and pulse, that repeats itself three times in total, max. So if the cow then hasn't returned to the pasture, they have escaped. And then you get a notification on your phone, like a push notification, for every pulse and for an eventual escape. When the cow has escaped, it's free to roam. You still obviously have their position in your app. Um, and, you know, normally what happens, because cows are, or, you know, grazing animals are herd animals, they want to move back to the rest of the herd, and they will do so without getting a pulse, because our system knows the difference between going out of a pasture and going in. So you're not allowed to go out, but you're free to go in again if you have. That is the basics. So in the app, this is how the app looks on the phone. Uh, you can see the position of the animals. Um, you can monitor the collars. You can track them. So this right one here shows that specific collar, where it's logged position, where it's had audio cues, and where it's had uh, pulses, if any. And every farmer can have statistics, and we have statistics, on how many audios and how many pulses each animal gets. And this is our proof of concept. So I can see audios are high, which is fine, but no pulses on the other side, which is good. And then, as I said, alerts you with a push notification if anything goes on. So where are we now then? We have proven flexible fencing solution. We've got more than 30,000 colors out in, you know, around the world. Um, majority is Norway, and then UK is second. And then there is other European countries coming behind that. We have, as I said, gathered more than 50 million hours of grazing, which is the hours that you need. And then, yeah, as you can see, it's in Norway, UK, Ireland, Belgium, and all these European countries. And then we have a growing body of research with the uh, renowned universities um, and starting up in the US as well, which is really exciting. And then, so this is, you know, this is how far along we are. But now we want to get even better, and we want to enable better grazing management, hopefully. And that's why I'm going to pass on to you, James, I think, from now. Cool. Thank you very much. OK, so um, yeah, so for me, it's an interesting context. My day-to-day my -day work is as a grazing consultant. And, um, and I know, as I'm sure many of you do, the benefits of improved grazing management not just for, for being able to grow more pasture, but also to improve di biodiversity, to enhance environmental, for enhanced environmental benefits, and to increase animal performance. And despite all of these numerous benefits of better grazing management, for many farmers, starting that journey is quite a big step. And there's a number of barriers to entry, and fencing and infrastructure is always a big one, as well as labor and knowledge. So my interest and my involvement with virtual fencing has been could this be a tool that enables more farmers to manage their ground and their animals in the best possible way? And, and that's the journey we sort of, I've been on with them, and, and it's one we continue now. Um, so yeah, I'll share what, um, my involvement with no fence and virtual fencing to date, and then we can move on to, to where we are at the moment. So I think um, no fence contact me, and um, because they were due to be at Groundswell last year. And obviously, this event was unfortunately cancelled. And so we started a conversation from there about um, managed grazing, the use of virtual fencing technology, 
and, and what the fit could be. And we realized there was some common objectives um, which we shared, which was we both wanted to enable regen re regeneration of the soil and enhance biodiversity on the farm and do that to produce high quality protein. We wanted to create a really good future for farming families and their communities. And we also wanted to have an impact at scale. And this is the thing with regenerative farming practices is we, it's not just people in the room that um, we want to do it and, just, and to keep doing more of it, but if for this to change, there's action to be felt across the industry. And to do that, there's a confidence piece, there's a knowledge piece, there's a community piece, and there's also an enabling piece which technology can come into. So we share some common objectives, which was good. Um, we recognize it's, it's, it's not the cow, it's the how, and it's the management of those animals and that land that's the big difference here between producers and between countries, and it's why meat is, is not only sustainable, it's, it's also ethical and essential in our diets if we can get the management right. But there's lots of barriers, so how do we chuck a big wrecking ball into that wall and bust through it and enable the industry to move forwards? So virtual fencing, can it be part of that change? Well, it's certainly changed the way Norwegian farmers are managing their animals and managing their land, and it's really improved their work-life balance because the animals no longer escape and they can see where they are whilst they're on holiday. In the UK context, we've got very different environments, and as we look to manage land with animals, we need to keep them closer together and move them much more regularly. And so this was the bit we needed to test, or this is the bit I wanted to test last year with no fence. Um, I was pretty certain the, the technology would work, but would it keep animals in a small area, and would they understand and learn how to move regularly? And if they did, what would the effects on their behavior and what's the impact on animal welfare? Because none of us want to do anything that has a negative effect. If anything, we, want, we only want to enhance welfare whilst improving management. So we formed a trial. I, put, I carried out a trial for them last year, kindly supported with some EU funding, whilst that was still available. Um, and we had two parts. First of all, could we keep animals in? The grass is always greener, and if we try to keep these animals in a small virtual fenced area, would they simply just walk out? Because it's almost, almost bound to happen, wasn't it? This thing around their neck beeps, and they just walk out. So that was part one. If we could do it, then what were the effects on performance and animal behavior? So two, two parts to the trial. So we took a group of heifers, 60 um, R2 heifers, so they were 12 months old at the start of the trial. This was in September last year. We put collars on, a, on half of them, and the other half didn't have a collar. The half with a collar used the virtual fencing system, and you see they're here, they're contained to a, a one-day paddock. Um, they've got virtual fencing on, on two sides, and there's obviously a hedge above them, and there's a, a fence below. And we transitioned them onto the system, and then we moved them through and we ended up in a full virtual fencing scenario where they had a virtual fence on all four sides. The control group used electric fencing and we matched the stocking density and the frequency of shifts so we had something that was comparable. So this little sequence shows how the animals move. So they were in this virtual fencing pasture over here on my right. And we can make that pasture bigger and then bigger again and it's a weird one because we're used, to those of you, hands up who moves animals regularly using electric fencing. Yeah, and it's quite a cool event, isn't it? You film on your phone sometimes, you move the fence and they run around the corner and they look really happy. Um, the virtual fencing is a very boring non-event. <laughs> and it's really not Instagrammable, <laughs> which is a big, big challenge for some of us in the audience. Um, they're grazing. You're not in the field when, they, when you expand the pasture, and so it's just through grazing they find the pasture shapes changed, and they use their ears to explore the new area, and they slowly move into it. So it's really not dramatic, but it's really calm, and it's quite interesting. It's not perhaps what I expected to see as we started doing this work. So the heifers we had learned and trained the system pretty quick. There's the control group using electric fencing. Um, three fence system, one behind, or one in front, one behind. So some small differences we, we knew straight away, we saw straight away. The physical fences, very clear grazing line, isn't there? And interesting, there's this cow here who's got a head, she's on her knees, risking life and death for an extra blade of grass. <sighs> what a bugger. Um, interestingly, she's a character in this herd. And in this virtual fencing herd, we have the similar characters. We have some cows that are always grazing on the edge. They're trotting around the edge of the paddock, 
and they're dipping into the sound zone to get a mouthful of grass and they're coming out into safety again. And they explore the edges of the virtual pastures. Of any given day, these cows, these confident cows, they're well trained and well rehearsed with the system and they will get majority of the sounds of the whole herd. So most of the herds that um, you know, Matt and David have, two or three animals are responsible for sort of 30 to 50% of the sounds and pulses in a given day. They explore the pasture, then we've got other animals that are in the middle. They're over here somewhere, and they're over there, and they're in the middle of the pasture, and they barely get any sounds, and they certainly get no pulses. So it's interesting how these different characters in the herd were always there, and sometimes we saw them, but it's only when we start monitoring what they're doing that we see them really come through, and they're both equally essential to that herd and being successful in their system. So how clean a line do we get on a virtual grazing paddock? We get a pretty clean line. We get a defined grazing line, but it's slightly blurred on the edge because that's the sound zone and that's where some of our cows are dipping into for an extra mouthful of grass. We had some wet weather in the trial and so from the comfort of my home, whilst watching Gogglebox, I, um, I can move the cattle to shelter. And I did that by expanding the pasture, changing the shape and the animals followed their ears and moved to a hedge where it was sheltered and then I pushed them back to a new paddock in the morning before I got there. The control group did that because I didn't go and shift them when I should have done probably whilst in the commercial break between the two, um, the two parts because <laughs> it was wet and it was late and it was dark. So it's interesting how you know, we, we're aware that move, it's not how many animals, it's how long they spend in one place. And with virtual fencing, they can move quicker and it's more flexible. So there's some advantages there you know, if you've got a soil type that um, is more sensitive. So this is... To 60 days of data and what we have is we have the number of sounds per with a ratio so it's the number of sounds per pulse so what that means is that over here when they first started training they got one pulse for every sound and that's them learning the system the longer they use the system the more pulses they got before so the more sounds they got before they got a pulse so they got much, much better at using their ears to navigate and avoiding getting a pulse. And that's what we want. We want to see this improvement. We see some events where things change. So this one here means that they went a long time without any pulses. They got a lot of sounds in that instance. But a lot of the spikes we found were, was my fault or it was human intervention. And so the lesson with virtual fencing is that you, when you enter and leave a paddock, you need to be a little bit more aware if the animals are used to following you, that you don't lead them across the line inadvertently. So there's a, a little human aw awareness element here of animals are used to their behavior, they're used to a certain act of behavior, and you need to be aware that you're sort of changing their behavior and how you interact with them. So animals got a lot more experience with the system. The number of pulses per day went down. The number of sounds per day went up. You see the average for the whole 60-day period was 34 sounds per 24 hours and less, just less than one pulse per heifer per day at the end of that period. In terms of pulses versus weight gain, we've got a slightly positive relationship between the more pulses an animal got, the higher their weight gain. And that's really driven by these two outliers which grew the quickest, but also got the most pulses, and they were grazing on the edge. So they got the more, slightly more grass. If we take those out, then we get a very normal distribution. And we had a couple issue, issues with a couple of heifers in that group, not that didn't learn the system, but that carried a bit of a worm burden through because um, the past they were grazing and had heifers that season. So conclusions from last year was that it works. Keeps the animals in, we achieved 1,500 kilo residuals because we were on ryegrass pasture and that was the, the practice on the farm and the animals did not escape. If they had escaped and if they did escape, it was human error in terms of unwittingly being followed across the line and another case of where another group of animals moved through the field and they wanted to join them. And hey, this is a virtual fence, it's not a physical barrier. Sometimes, anim sometimes animals jump out, even physical fences. So there's a different awareness with a virtual fence, thinking about the movement of other animals and, and what events could trigger. If they did escape, they didn't damage any fences because it's virtual. And the animals that did escape always came back in of their own accord because they could. 
So the boundaries need to be there, but internally, as long as you're prepared to relax slightly, animals can come out and move in, but 98% of the time they stay where they should. That's really interesting. So we were chatting through the winter and over Christmas about what do we do next. And as the awareness, this was one farm and one group of animals. And to be sure this is successful for everyone, we needed to bring in more farmers. So the pilot project was born. And before we went to that pilot project, no offense, Connie did some app development. And we did things, so they did things like brought in heat maps showing where the animals are, gave the ability to put markers on the map to show where permanent fences and water points are to make it easier to plan the virtual paddocks. And with those app developments, we felt it was a good time to start the pilot project. So pilot project started in March of this year. And we just wanted to see if it was effective across a range of farms, stock classes, land classes, management types. And also I knew that David would push the limits of what was possible. <laughs> and um, and he's certainly, certainly done that for us. Um, so it's, and it's good to bring other people in because you can train people how to use the technology and then you leave and they just do what they want. So it's good to see, good to test things. So we, at the moment we've got five pilot farmers that are involved in this. Um, we've got Tim May, Oliver Cledgerley. Uh, they're milking, milking 420 cows in Hampshire on a farm that's being managed very regeneratively. Um, we, fitted, we fitted collars to their calves. We actually did that this week. Um, so that's been interesting. Uh, we've got James Evans. Uh, James has joined us in the audience. Uh, organic beef farmer in Shropshire. He's got 51 autumn calving cows, um, grazing a wonderful diverse herbal lay. Um, there's a really interesting plant called the Shropshire chicory. It looks like a dock, but it's not, apparently. Um, we've got Matt Turner's on stage in Wiltshire. Um, beef farmers and arable farmers. Uh, Matt's got collars on some of his yearling cattle, yearling heifers, grazing some river meadows. Uh, Matt will chat about that in a minute. David, organic beef, sheep, and goat farmer, and they're on a group of yearlings on an estate, on some estate ground. And then we've got Tom Armitage, who's at the back in the doorway, um, another beef farmer, and Tom's got them on spring calving cows with calves. So I'm going to hand over to David, and David's going to chat through how he's using the technology, um, and give his context, um, and we've got some slides to help that, and I'll, uh, yeah, I'll prompt and prod you along, David, with some, uh, some questions as, uh, as needed. So, yeah, just tell us a brief, brief, a little brief bit about the farm, David, um, and uh, what's on there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we are organic beef and sheep uh, down in South Devon uh, near Totnes. So uh, when James came with the opportunity to be able to use these nose fence collars, it was, I was really keen because we'd actually just taken on a fresh block of ground um, that I was quite keen to get some rotation and grazing on because we, we take all our cattle through to finish uh, from the suckler herd. And I was quite keen to be able to improve some of these relatively large pastures um, down at Sharpham that have been just set stocked in the past and they're a bit variable in quality in different places. Um, but it was somewhere that couldn't really go putting up lots of poly wire fencing um, right in front of the big house of the, of the Sharpham estate. They're not going to want me subdividing that up with poly wire all summer. And it's fairly steep, which means it's fairly hard work if you're picking them up and putting them down all the time. Um, so it would have been sort of there for the summer fences and moving through paddocks. Um, so that wasn't going to be ideal. Um, so that would have made, yeah, made life difficult. So they would have probably continued to be set stocked. Um, as well as then when you get down the lower end of the estate, we've got an area of sort of open access, um, which was supposed to be footpaths, but it's effectively open access. Um, so subdividing that to be able to graze was, was a non-starter as well. So it's actually allowing us to be able, by using this system, um, which is working really well, we've been able to actually implement some managed grazing across those sites. Um, so yeah, that's the, um, that's what it is. And yeah, so here we're just overlooking the, the river Dart. Um, yes, yeah, so that's looking down, down the river. Um, so what we've put them on is a bunch of 41 growing cattle. So they're just coming up to finishing now. Um, so they they were turned out first week of March. Yeah. Yeah, they've been out wintered on fodder beat. Fitted the collars around about the first week of March, and trained them go, trained them as they went on to grass from fodder beat. So we're still running back to the fodder beat fence and training. Uh, onto the virtual fence in a grass field adjacent. Um, and they were there for about 10 days and we took them down to, to the new ground at, uh, at Sharpham and put them out there on grass ground and they've been on 
solely virtual fencing ever since. So talk us through what's happening there, David, and those two um, two screen grabs from the mobile fence or the no fence app. Yeah. So this is um, this would be soon after we came to Sharpen. We were grazing um, a grass field here. We had a water point here in this bottom corner and another water point up here, um, and the field goat carries on a bit that way. So initially we grazed um, three paddocks through the bottom end of the field to give us um, so three days of moves, so on daily moves. And then in order to get back to water, when we came through the second strip, we, we gave them a strip, and then that's about 20 metres wide, running back to the water trough. So in this picture, they're all clustering around the water because they've gone back to drink. Uh, this is the same pasture. Um, I don't know what time. So that was 20 past 11 in the morning. Uh, this was how about 6 in the morning. So they're all over grazing. Um, yeah, grazing there in the morning. Um, so yeah, that's, that just shows you on your phone, real time, where the cattle actually are um, when you have a look. Yeah, so they did well in that field though, didn't they? And they were, what, two or three weeks grazing that field? Yeah, but and uh, yeah about yeah, two, and two and a half weeks, something like that, and yeah. then uh, moved on. And then, you then you did this, yeah. which um, yeah. when I... Uh, then I frightened them all <laughs> when they saw what I'd done. So it was a Sunday morning, and I had to be at the in-laws. So the night before, whilst they were all lied up here, I drew a pasture down across this field that was, um, had been cultivated at the time but not seeded, and I wanted to get them down here, right to the bottom of the estate. So I opened, flicked this gate open and drew a pasture um, and left it right the way down around, so down over some steep hills, around the end of the woods and back in uh, to a, a meadow in the bottom, which was the next base it had to get to. <laughs> left them to it, um, just kept checking my phone, and in the morning, so the first thing, I saw them heading down to the water trough. They found the gate was open, and off they trotted down the bottom uh, within an hour or so. Well, this, this is them going down, so that was, that was 10 o'clock the night before I'd, that had been drawn up. Um, by 8 o'clock, this was them going down around and in, and then, um, yeah, they just stayed in that field there, happy because that's where the most grass was um, in the afternoon. Um, so, yeah, they, they actually moved themselves. Had I decided that I was going to do that on Sunday morning, um, to get them down there before we had to be at the in-laws on a certain time. That would have involved me, the wife, three kids, and probably a lot of swearing, um, <laughs> mostly at me. Um, so, yeah, it just shows that actually what you can do is quite amazing. That They'd learnt the system. So that was, uh, they'd been about, about a fortnight four back. Yeah, so four weeks using four the four weeks in. Yeah. yeah, so four yeah. weeks on the collars. Um, and, yeah, they, they followed that track down. Um, so that's, uh, I was impressed and uh, yeah, shows what they can do. Yeah, yeah. and then here we've just got a, say, another screen grab from the app. We've got a heat map which shows where the animals have spent the last 24 hours. And then there's some history in the app so you can see where they spent their time yesterday and then where they spent the last seven days. And it's relatively simple to think we can extend that in the app to show you know, two, three, four weeks so you can capture your grazing history and also animal density, where they've been congregating and maybe you can use that to your advantage or try to avoid that in the next rotation. Um, some, some stats then, because I love stats. Um, we've got the numbers along the bottom of the chart are days, so that's days that they've been using the no-fence system. The blue bar is number of sounds per animal per day, and the green is number of pulses per animal per day. And you see the first 24 days, we've got, if you like, a, a slightly lower ratio of, um, of sounds to shocks, so as they were learning the system, and then the ratio increased, and on David's farm, it's kept increasing. So the average animal during the, the past or the last 30 days has had 17 sounds, but only had half a shock or just less than half a shock a day. And that's the average animal within your herd, David. We see, what, two animals in particular that get pick up most of the pulses and yeah. most of the sounds? Yeah, there's two of their uh, are real characters. Yeah, they must spend their entire time walking the boundary because, yeah, there's, they, I think they just like the radio. <laughs> yeah. And you had a couple of Belted Galloways in that um, group as well. Yes. How have they been using it? Um, so you had a couple of Belted Galloways we bought. They weren't so used to the poly wire when we were training, and they were a nightmare for nipping under the poly wire um, out in the fodder beat when they were going out that way. But they have learned the no fence considerably better than they ever learned poly wire. Um, so yeah, they're, they're little characters, but they're fine, and they're they just go at their own speed, and they, yeah, they'll find, the, find when the wires move, or the, the virtual fence has moved, and just plod out through. But yeah. I think if I'd had them on polywire, I would have been doing my nut in this summer. 
I think, yeah, little characters wa were, wasn't what you referred to them as, at them as when they were going through the uh, 40 white fences on the fodder beat. And, uh, <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, cool. Well, thank you, David. Um, yep. Cool. Matt, we'll ask you to stand up and, and grab a mic. But um, it's not singing this time. You didn't have that last night in the bar. No, just speak. It should be. Hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, a bit of background, Matt. Yeah, um, so we're a uh, pretty standard mixed farm, um, about 1,000 hectares, half and half, grass and, um, grass and arable crops, really. Um, we can't grow anything too exciting because it's just sort of chalky, flinty stuff. So it's, uh, yeah, wheat, barley and all that sort of thing. But, um, uh, but yeah, no, it's a uh, bit of permanent pasture. We, we, we farm by Stonehenge, so a fair bit of National Trust ground. And, uh, and we are rotating um, grass around the arable uh, as well. And, uh, and we've got uh, water meadows, which is what we've been doing this trial on. Uh, well, we thought it was the most sensible place to do the trial anyway. And uh, yeah, it's a suckler herd, um, about 180, 190 head. Um, we try and keep things through to finish, um, mainly just because of TB, keeps the life simpler. But um, uh, yeah, mixture, mixture of breeds, mainly Hereford cross cows. Um, but the, yeah, the, the, we've got limo bulls, Angus, Charolais, um, Devons. So um, yeah, good old Heinz 57 of everything. But, um, so how, how is this area normally managed, Matt? So we've got, um, got a river, river meadows, and the river runs right through the middle. Um, and that river's unfenced at the moment. Yes, yeah, we, um, we set stock everything at the moment, but um, James is gradually swaying me to go um, the other route. Um, and uh, yeah, this would have normally, we would have just normally chucked a bunch of animals out here and, uh, and left them alone, but it's, yeah, it's getting weedier and weedier and um, wants managing properly, basically. And, uh, and this has encouraged us to do it. We, um, yeah, we would have just carried on as normal, but it's, uh, yeah, this seems to have um, hurried the job along. And, uh, it was an opportunity, wasn't there? Because um, you recognise that uh, hey, it's river meadows, so there's fertility there, um, and there's some lovely species if they were allowed to express themselves. And just the part of the country and the soil top you're on, you quite often dry up sort of July time, and then bring hay into those fields. Yeah. And so, so I saw recently from a different from a different angle, so an opportunity there just to change the management. And so we said, well, with virtual fencing, can we keep them out of the river? There's a bonus there, and can we improve the grazing management at the same time? If we just permanently fence the river. Well, for one, the, the geese and ducks you've got would have struggle, having, struggle getting access like they do now. Yeah. And also, it wouldn't improve the management. We'd just be set stocking a big piece of land that had been permanently fenced. So, a good opportunity. Um, the challenge was, Matt, wasn't it, about infrastructure and water? Because they normally drink from the river, and that's very accessible. So, we had to invest in some pipes. Yeah, we, we, we spent the day fighting with poly, um, poly pipe for a, um, But uh, no, it was, it was okay. We, we got a few hydrants dotted about. And I'm just basically dragging the trough um, behind them. Each I can move the front fence in my leisure, um, and then when I get time, I move the trough and then retract the back fence up, basically. So it's um, yeah, yeah. So there was a couple. There was some water points that were either next to or just outside of the block, wasn't there? So you can see the screen behind me. The green, the blue lines are water pipe. The pink dots are hydrants, quick release hydrants. And then, yeah, Matt's got a trough with 150 metres of pipe attached to it. And the blue, the lighter blue lines are sort of the radius that can be watered from, from one hydrant. So you see there's a few, a few blank areas of the pasture, but um, there's pretty good coverage for that mobile trough system. And you need that flexibility, or it's nice to have that flexibility with a virtual fencing system, because then you really can be flexible and, and make these pastures any, sh any size or shape. Um, so I think that's cows in a pasture. That shows the river, river nicely. Yeah, yeah, we're um, we're surprised how how you can hold them back, how the residuals can be so low, and uh, that bit of juicy grass isn't too far away. But it's uh, somehow they respect the system, and they they hear that sound, and they suddenly back off. And uh, um, and yeah, it's just nice to be able to keep them out of the river. They're making a mess. The other the other lot that we've got, the sort of the control lot, they they get bad feet. They're always pointlessly going in the river on the gravelly bed. And uh, yeah, it's nice not having them. Not having and making a mess everywhere, and um, uh, yeah. so this was this was trial phase, wasn't it? So the, the previous picture was they just had the collars fitted. This was yeah. 16th of March, I think they went onto the, yeah, the field. March, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it was, you know, spring spring had arrived. March was here, and it really didn't arrive properly, did it? Until May, end of May, sometime. Um, so there was some cover, wasn't there? And we sort of said, well, we ought to start grazing because if we don't start now, grass will get ahead of us. 
really kick off in April. We ran out of fees, so we had to, we had to get <laughs> the buggers yes. out, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we kept the fence up alongside the river whilst they were training, didn't we? Um, yes, yeah. And yeah, then I, they um, sort I of continued on. I had 400 metres on my, on my roll of poly wire, so I put that along the edge of the river. And um, we moved them a couple of times. We ended up with a, started off with a front fence. And we trained them in that first paddock, didn't we? Just moved the virtual fence just in from the physical fence. And they, they got a hang of the whole sound and shock sequence. And then we moved them a couple of times. And then we brought in a back fence. And then I ran out of my 400 metres and thought, well, we'll go for it. And um, yeah, yeah good, no, good no disaster now. since then, really. So no. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, so, this, so that's, that was the heifers back in back in March, and they're um, they're growing uh, well, just over a kilo a day. Aren't yeah, they? yeah, so I've got some uh, got some weight gain um, stuff. It's uh, that is that is the one thing I've had is we've had to loosen the collars a little bit. It's surprising how loose you can have them, but um, yeah, surprising how, ne how much the necks swell up. <laughs> but um, the yeah. new the new style neck straps we're, we're having to cable tie the the chains back on themselves but at least now we don't have to we can it's just easy to run them through the crush when we're weighing them and um yeah slacking them off so it's yeah so on growing animals the neck trap also gets tighter so probably for you it's been 40 to 60 days hasn't it because they're growing quick yeah and yeah, um and you know we've seen on this is a permanent pasture so the the picture i had up was what it what this place looks like now when that catches up maybe not there we go. Yeah, so that was it on Monday. So we've ha had the spring surplus come through, and say so this management change means there's more feed on that block than I've ever ever seen before. Yeah. Um, and so the animals, you know, being able to be fed ad lib, um, so they have you know putting a good amount of weight gain on and looking well, really well for it. Yeah, um, we're trying to skip them on a little bit quicker. With, yeah, daily shifts just to try and and get ahead of the grass really aren't we, we I, I took a proportion out for some cows and calves when things were a bit desperate in the in the spring it's hard to believe but the grass was a bit short for a while um so that took a little bit out of the platform but um yeah it seems, it seems to be growing well behind them doesn't it it's and there's liver test the system there's a there's a pond or a lake isn't there sort of yeah, yeah gravel pit, certainly in yeah. gravel pit um so we're using the exclusion zone so we're in your pastures you can draw shapes that you want to keep animals out of it could be where there's nesting birds could be flowers could be Parts not to graze, um, so this was to keep them from grazing the gravel pit. Um, worked really effectively, and even though this corridor is quite narrow, they navigated and grazed around that really well. And then the awkward bit of the pasture is the reset, isn't it? For them to go back around the block, they've got to go through the river. Yes, yeah, it was, uh, it was exciting the first time because it was it was fairly <laughs> well on up there. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, yeah well, one or two, uh, yeah, those three. One or two others crept in, and then there was just one bugger that didn't want to go over. But she she found them eventually as they as they as they carried on on the other side. But yeah. um, but that reset's been organic and it's been managed as well. So they they're held on one side in a, in a day. They're da moving daily at the moment, and then the pasture gets expanded. No one goes to the field to chase them. The animals start to move across, find they can drink from the river. Then one crosses, and the rest of the herd follows. And then that pasture's pulled up, and they're excluded from the river again. So. It's amazing how low stress that's been for the animals because we haven't had to go out there and shout at them and try and push them through. They've found it of their own accord, and that reset's worked really well. As it happens, I, um, I did that shift yesterday when I was here, um, and they all, they all went over very very well this time. The, the, uh, the river's retracted a little bit, and um, they got used to it or something, I don't know, but they've, uh, yeah, they all pour. And the water's, warm, well. water's warmed up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so a, a, slightly, well, a similar story for Matt's in terms of um, animal response and behaviour change. So, um, sounds and pulses, um, as they learnt the system, the repulses per day was slightly higher, and then that's really dropped away now. And some of that's because they're in that surplus of feed, and they've learnt where that boundary is. Um, so we're about 15 sounds a day, and we're registering at um, yeah, less than half a, a pulse an animal a day at the moment and bear in mind they're moving daily so that pasture is changing on a daily basis so they're able to find the edge of that new pasture learn it remember it and then not incur a pulse or a sound so it's really interesting to see and yeah weight gains on permanent pasture um these are suckler bred heifers they are, were a year old in april march yeah. april yeah. yeah yeah so 16 like months now the oldest 15 16 months yeah we'll, be, um, we'll be thinking of drawing from one or two um on their next time round, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so they're, they're, they're getting there. Yeah. Yeah. So we started yeah. the uh, cattle there at 400 kilos to start with, and they've put on just over a kilo a day. The best done kilo and a half on that river meadow, unimproved, permanent pasture, 
And I'm pretty convinced that that management change, that ability to grow more grass, allocate the animals to it, to um, that's driven some of that performance. And yeah, we're in a fantastic position where you'll be able to kill most of that group before they come back in the shed. Yeah, yeah, and we, um, well, the intention is possibly to take their collars and um, do a little bit of our own trial and introduce some newbies to the job and uh, not have poly wire and just hope that they learn from their friends and uh, um, and see, what, see how it goes, really, I think. But yeah, it'll, be, yeah. it'll be an interesting trial to see if, um, without any training at all, to see if, they, uh, see if they respect the system. They'll get more shocks, no doubt, for a while, but um, uh, they're not going to do anything too silly because they're a herd animal, even if they do get out they're going to creep back again. So it's... Uh, um, yeah, so that's uh, been good. Interesting. Cool, thank you, Matt. No worries. Yeah. So I've got a couple, couple of slides on where we think we're, we're going with this and what we're adding in already. Um, a big awareness about the need to bring some education with it. So what we said about measuring grass, so I could go and measure the grass for a farmer and give them the, the numbers and say, here you are, and now you can manage your pasture. They wouldn't manage their pasture. So doing something in that education piece of, of how to... Yeah, what are the principles of grazing management and being able to use the collars effectively is really important. So working on a bit of a, an academy piece with no fence that will be accessible to everyone. Developing the app to become the sort of pocket grazing manager. Um, and then also to bring in more through into the animal health and behavior. So you know, if an animal hasn't moved for six hours, letting you know. Is it stuck? Is it um, unwell? I'm just going to dead. Dead's a bit negative. Um, is it in heat? Has it been served? Who served it? You know, every, every, if every animal's got a collar, we can detect that. That's useful information. They do, yes. So that gives you the opportunity. Yeah. Sorry? Behaviours of the bull or the behaviours of the heifers? Yeah, the th new animals added to the group learn from the other animals in the, in the herd. So you could add the bull in untrained, and he'd learn from the other animals. Yeah. Um, but the grazing, the grazing piece certainly is a piece that interests me. So we're working with, uh, with Rumi. Um, they had a standard presentation here, and they're using satellite data to, to estimate pasture covers. So they can look at your farm, tell you where there's the most pasture, where's the least pasture. We couple that to a virtual fencing system, and this overlay, this sort of heat map of pasture density will say, as you draw your virtual pasture, okay, that's a day's worth of feed for that group of animals. And you've got 25 days of feed ahead, and this is where the most pasture is. This is where you need to move to next, because if we remove our internal fences, then we can move across the landscape to where the feed is most plentiful, and we can avoid areas that have been overgrazed or perhaps pugged in a previous, a previous season. So the flexibility with this becomes really interesting. We just don't need to make it complicated. We need to make it as simple as possible to implement and to, to follow best practice. So that piece and the work we're doing with the pilot farmers now is to bring some of that satellite data into the app to help with pasture allocation and paddock size, which is, which is really cool. So we say, we've got, we know you've got 45 animals in this herd, you've told us what the weight is, and we've measured the grass, or the satellite has, and we know that you need to allocate 0.24 of a hectare per day. And, and if you want to do it, move them every 12 hours, well, that's fine as well. So automatic moves, being able to move the pastures at 6 a.m. every day, well, that's, that's coming as well. And that's a really interesting piece about being able to move the animals regularly, automatically, and then come and check them later on. So set up that move when, the, when you know the wet weather's going to come through and just shift the animals and leave, a clean, leave clean ground behind you. Cool. So that's, that's it from us, guys. And, yeah, so we're happy to take questions and um, really lucky to have... It's not just people you see on stage, but also James and Tom uh, are stood behind you or sat behind you, so we can handle a range of questions. I will. Yeah. So you first, sir. Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> In Wales, I believe they've banned use of electronic dog collars. Is there a likelihood that the Welsh Assembly would start poking and interfering and ban something like this as well? So... To ban it in Wales or ban it in England? No, we're working with, so the, the just to talk about Wales, yeah. So the, the electric, it is a, kind of the regulations around this is a bit not easy to um, interpret because it would be like, 
most countries don't have a regulation on flying cars because they're not here yet. But that specific regulation, um, Wales, the NRW, is working on a project now with um, five different projects using no fence and investigating um, if they want to adapt it. So it's in movement, and I don't see the likelihood of it happening in England at the moment with uh, what's going on now. No, I wouldn't say so. Uh, th my, my confidence is the moment they open their eyes and decide to have a look at it, I leave them to it because I think it's going to be fine. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, should we do... Yeah, you choose one, yeah? Yeah, that one, yeah. Hi. In the presentation, how many apps have we actually seen, which has been no offence, which has been roomy, and has anything been precision farming? Has there been an overlap there? What, what have we no, been the, looking the, at? All, all the app, all the screenshots you've seen have been the no offence app, and the piece that's been worked on now is to bring the satellite imagery in as a layer. So like you have a satellite layer and you may have a road map layer or OS map layer, so bring that satellite imagery as another layer to the map. So one app. quick questions. <laughs> um, so one of which, um, you talked about how if the animals get out, they can come back by themselves. Do they get shocked coming back to the herd, or does the, does the system intelligent enough to want them to let them come back in without shocking no. them? Um, the second question is, um, and you kind of touched on this, but question. linking with other apps. What Other than Rumi, are you looking at linking it with any other apps, like maybe the land app or things that farmers might be using for their land management? My other question is, um, all the examples that you've given are just constant pasture. Um, have you experimented with systems like agroforestry, where they might have something more tempting that they want to go for? Alternatively, have you looked at landscapes where there might be something less tempting, like a lot of scrub, that you kind of want to keep them in to break them down? And do you see an increase of them breaking out um, in those situations? Our final question is specifically for David, which is that I understand that there's a rewilding project in the estate that you're currently farming run by Ambios, and I was wondering if there was any overlap between you using the system to very carefully manage your grazing and, and, and your role or a potential role that you might have in a rewilding system. I hope that's sort of roughly all made sense. Yeah, that was easy. Um, yeah. Matt. <laughs> No, I'll do question do, one, July. Yeah, you do question. Well, Sin, Sin do question one. Yeah, I can do. I can do. I think I can do um, the second question as well. So, first question: um, Our system knows if you're going in or out of a pasture. So, if you're returning, no pulse, no audio, no pulse. That's important. Um, and which is clever when you use GPS. So, yeah, that's not not an issue. Um, and then, yeah, this is this is these are doing managed grazing. But the majority of my UK um, customers at the moment are doing conservation grazing, uh, woodland grazing, upland grazing, um, and they're using it to, you know, intensive grazing in certain areas. I don't have a specific answer to what the escapes is looking like, but then escapes are so rare that I would, I can't think of anyone because they would have been in touch with me if they had a lot of escapes in that situation. And yeah, and this system is made in Norway where the majority of what farmers are trying to do is to graze other areas than, you know, grasslands. They want to graze the forest. They want to graze the woods uh, because that's all where all our resources are at the moment. We don't have a lot of grassland. So, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Sorry. David, do you want to answer the shop? Um, yes. So on the Sharpham and the rewilding project, so part of the estate is doing a little rewilding project. Um, they are currently, haven't got any livestock apart from, they did have a couple of pigs in to um, do a bit of rooting around the other day. So they are watching with interest the system and they're quite interested in it, if they, depending on how they decide to manage livestock within it, but I'm not sure they've got a plan as to what livestock they're going to use within it, but they're definitely interested in the system and seeing how we're getting on with it and keeping it updated. And your comment about getting to eat the less desirable stuff I did make mine go and tidy out a corner with some nettles and rubbish uh, when there's lots of nice grass over the render field, um, and they stayed there very well. Um, yeah, they once they've learned the system, they respect the system, and you can graze the tight residuals. So eating a bit of trash isn't too much of an issue. Yeah, and in terms of rewilding, we've got several projects. So let me know if you want to get in touch with 
Any of them, yeah. And I guess there's, there's an app integration question, and yeah, yeah there's no, yeah, hey, we're, we're in this not to make everyone sign up to 16 apps, but to, to work with as succinct and simple a system as possible, which enables good land management. So if there's something, a, a map layer that is helpful, if there's a partner to work with, the collar's got Bluetooth, so other Bluetooth devices from Rumen boluses to pedometers could link and go through the gateway. So the idea was to be to collaborate and not to try and reinvent. Yeah, hi, I've got a um, couple of questions. The first one is we're looking to implement uh, No Fence this autumn. Um, and question about how old you have the calves have to be before you put collar on them. So we uh, wean quite late, we naturally wean. Um, so it's kind of what age am I going to need to get collars for that? Second question is around your exclusion zones. How accurate can you be with an exclusion zone? Can it, I mean, is it literally down to a particular ground nesting bird or is it, what's that sp size that you can get down to? Okay, um, I guess in terms of when to fit collars, we'll, we'll gain some evidence. Um, Tom just, just stood behind you. Um, might be worth having a chat with him before you leave. Um, he's got cows with collars, spring calving cows. Um, calves aren't wearing a collar yet and they'd be sort of pushing three months old at this stage. So no issues to date with calves leaving cows, and we'll, we'll follow that with interest to see what age we get to. Um, as to when that becomes a problem, when calves might leave the cows astray. Um, so yeah, we'll watch that space. It may not become a problem at all. I guess it may depend on stocking density. In terms of the accuracy of the virtual fencing, it's obviously down to the accuracy of the person drawing the pasture on the app, but the GPS accuracy is really, really good. And so if we were to draw a line that met with the edge of the stage, all we've got to take into account is that sound zone, which is one to two meters wide. So you get a very clearly defined grazing edge. And when Matt, if you've set it on the edge of the river, then they're grazing to the top of the bank if you want them to, and no further. Yeah, you can, you can zoom in pretty well and, um, and be fairly accurate with the line, can't you? But, um, but yeah, there's, I mean, to be very accurate, you could hold a collar yourself and yeah. you know you know where the sound is basically you don't have to give yourself a shock but um if you sort of swing it Hold in the, the line plastic. Then <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. um and that gives you a pretty good idea if yeah. it, if you're worried about where your line is if it has to be particularly accurate yeah yeah i guess since that comes back to the agroforestry spec and that's a really interesting case for me as we bring trees in where we're spending a lot of money on tree guards which for net for wildlife may still be necessary but we've got to put, if we've got to put fences both sides of all these tree rows that we want to put in well, I think if we could leave a four to six meter margin, either side, you know, or three meters, two to three meters either side of the trees, then the GPS accuracy would be sufficient for them not to graze the trees. Well, that's awesome. Because not only do we get a system that stops them grazing the trees, but also we get a system that, that um, enables better management of the area between the trees. So in that space, that could be really handy. And if anyone's got an agroforestry project they're starting or have started, then that'd be a cool person to speak to. Hello, uh, Richard Gardner, Dairy Farmer. Have you got it on any dairy farms? So we've got it with Oliver Chagley, who's milking, he's an organic once a day farmer for milking through a mobile dairy. So it's not on his cows, it's on his R1 heifers. Um, but they're really excited about the prospect for cows. So a lot of this is build a little bit of confidence, see if it works in their situation and then bring it through. I've got robots that graze. Is it possible to do that, or how would you get them to and from the field without getting a shock? Yeah, it's definitely easy to bring them in and out. You can set virtual laneways, and it might be a, a case of moving them to the pasture, which lets them go back to the yard, and you can set that for a timed event. So if you wanted them to graze four hours and have access back to the robots, then you'd set a timed event for four hours grazing, and then the virtual laneway to the robot opens up, and obviously, I don't know if you're ABC system, but you could do something in that space where they could move through to the next pasture. So a lot of this is the collars and the, the basics and the, hard, and the hardware here work. And most of what's evolution's needed next is the app development. So working with someone like yourself to say, how do you want to manage your system with this? What features do you need? And how do you want to set up those virtual pastures so that they can go back to the robots and not return back to the paddock? And we need farmers to tell us what they need. So join us and we could, we're going to see what we can do yeah you get really nice shillow as well yeah it's pretty pretty, pretty cool eh? and and you you nice look bright you, color 
Yeah, you'd look good in blue. You'd look good in blue. Um, I was just going to ask, do you do it for any other species uh, or just cows at the moment, or cattle? Cows, sheep and goats at the moment, um, yeah. Depends. <laughs> do you want to ask a chance to mention, or you can mention the trial? Sorry? The Groundswell offer. I was going to mention the groundswell offer that I do recommend get in, getting involved with. So um, we want people to get started with virtual fencing. So right now there is an offer for groundswell to, um, to get 25 colours, or up to 25, depending on what you need. Uh, we'll ship them to you. We'll do an online course with us and James. And then you can hold on to the colours until the end of September. And then by that time, you can choose, all right, am I going to keep fencing virtually or I'm going to do electric fencing um, and uh, and if you decide to go virtual then uh, we'll give you extra discounts so basically you're getting 12 months of grazing no 18 months of grazing for the price of 12 so what you can do then is that I've got my colleagues back there um, and they have a computer where you can uh, can sign up or you can some of you have gotten a form as well um, like a sheet of paper to sign up at home and if you sign up now I can promise you an awesome cap can. Two just very quick questions. Um, one is battery life. Presumably it's battery powered. Um, and if you've got those certain individuals who activate the sound much more readily, are you going to get colours running out um, you know, quite quickly? And um, the other one is what's the voltage of your pulse? Right. Um, do I can do the battery do voltage. Life start. Well, do voltage and then we'll get Matt and Dave to come oh, out on battery know. life. Do you know the voltage? I can't got no in my head what it is. Okay. Well, point, point two of a joule yeah, sorry. Is, the, is the current rather than voltage, because that's what the energizers drive off. So it's, it's a tiny fraction of what a mains energizer would put out. Obviously, its location is much better. And that's why it's been successful controlling both of Galloway's and, and Highland cattle, is because of its location. Um, and there's adjustment on that. So there's a chance for adjustment depending on weight and age of animal. And it's why the sheep and goat collar um, delivers a much lower charge than the cattle collar, proportion of the body weight. Um, yeah, battery life, there's solar panels on both sides of the collars. Um, so yeah, David and Matt, you can chat about um, battery life so far. And Yeah, well the ones hunting around the edge, I've, I've got one or two um, ones as well, which, um, uh, which get, would get sometimes hundreds of sounds a day and a number of shocks, but they've all, because it's summer, they've all stayed at about between 95 and 100 percent battery, basically, it's uh, the winter cropping or strip grazing could be an interesting trial to see how they do over the winter. But I've got a fair bit of confidence that they've stayed at 100 percent, or that they're going to last for months, regardless of any sun. Um, so um, yeah, I think they could probably go through through a winter, but it'll be interesting to trial it. Yeah, I can just yeah comment on that as well. So what we normally say is that from 1st of March to 1st of November. No, like I can guarantee battery life through that. Uh, when we get to first of November, then it is the, it is getting around the winter months, like uh, like Matt's saying. But then um, we have certain tips and tricks at No Fence, and we can turn out your reporting intervals, and we can help you on the last patch to get through um, to next spring. Um, if a farmer buys No Fence and wants to disprove me on the fact that we can get around the whole year, they will manage to do that. But if you, um, yeah, if you listen to our good support team, then yeah, we can get you through um, all year. And we're gathering a lot of interesting data this year, this winter, with this guys, and see what, see what they're getting on. Um, I've got two very quick questions. Do you have a battery indicator on on the app so you can see if a collar's running low? Percentage out of a hundred. Yep. Right. And the other one is, I mean, do you, do you not bother with a perimeter fence at all? You can just let them look as if they're wild. Uh, we suggest on the block, so whatever your block is between, you know, the or whether the block's between you and the neighbour or you and the road, fence there, and then internally, if you, you can operate how you wish, so you could remove or not repair, replace the internal hedges, fences on the internal hedges, and then when you drew your virtual pasture, exclude the cattle from them. Um, if you had internal fences, were just for internal fences, then yeah, they, they wouldn't wouldn't be need you wouldn't need to replace them. We can move the animals through. So we're 
as effective as it is, it won't stop instinct or, or events where the animals are spooked or scared. So the position for permanent fencing is how far am I prepared to let them potentially get to before they could stop? And, and also, how <laughs> yeah, do I like sleeping at night and what's my risk profile? So that's where the permanent fencing still plays a role. Should we hear from David just what, do you have perimeter fencing around all? Um, so we've got perimeter fencing uh, on some of it, that down against the river and that, they can get onto the foreshore and go for a wander if you're not careful, but with the no fence, they, they can't get there. So that saves a lot of risk of that, or people leaving the footpath gates open, they can't go out through them. So um, that's fine. I mean, I leave the internal gates through on that block all open now and just driving it out so I don't, I don't get out of the truck to shut the gate after I've been to check them because um, there's no need. They're all, all in within, behind their paddock. Um, so, the only, yeah, I would say you want to have your, your, your roads need to be fenced because count on the road is never good. Um, I, yeah, I would trust it against a neighbour's wheat field, but I wouldn't want them on the A303, something like that would be my sort of uh, judgment. Are there any trials with sheep yet? Are they as effective as keeping sheep contained? Oh, that's a very good question. So we've done sheep for we've done sheep as long as we've done cattle, um, and we did university trials in 2018, and then pilots in Norway in, in 2019. And uh, actually, when we compare, we look at the data for the sheep, um, the goats, and the cattle. Then the ones who have the lowest ratio of none of a high one, but the lowest ratio for for audios over pulses is. Um, is sheep. So uh, we have debunked uh, that sheep are stupid. Yeah, they are clever. Yeah, just one behind you there. Hi, this all sounds wonderful. Um, just wanted to ask, because I'm not very au fait with the technology, but is this dependent on 3G or 4G or 5G or something like this? And, it, and you know, what happens if the, when it goes down? Should I? Yeah, so, so t it needs a 2G network to communicate with the collar, so that's the same network you use for calls or texts. So 4G as well now? Yes, yeah, so, so it can use all of the Gs, um, but it doesn't need 4G necessarily to, to communicate. Um, it needs the mobile network to communicate. So if you want to know where your animals are, then the collars need to be in, in signal. However, the virtual pasture you assign them to is always effective, even if the mobile network's to drop out. So it means that if you have a paddock or an area of land where the signal's patchy, as long as they can, you can bring them to signal to, to shift them, they can operate in that area even without signal. Yeah, so the only reason for fences to stop working is really if all the satellites then stop working at the same time, then I think as a global world, you know, roaming cows, smaller issue than the other issues we're facing. Well, guys, if, um, if that's it, I'll take one more to this with the last question then. Sorry, on the issue of safety, have you got any experience with dogs and on uh, footpaths? Um, the cows were obviously respect uh, imaginary boundary, but if you've got walkers and dogs who don't know that's how they're being controlled, what, uh, what's your, uh, what, uh, what have you found out, what's, what's been the responses to it? I think the responses have been, been surprisingly good. Obviously the, the downside of a virtual fence is that I'm fencing animals in but I can't fence anything out, such as, um, you know, the issue is, uh, people talk about the issue being the dog, but then you might question owners letting their dog lose in areas with, with livestock but I think yeah, one, of, one of the examples is, um, is Epping Forest and they've you know, th through Covid they had a 300% increase in their visitors and they're running cattle through public access lands and they haven't had a single issue with, with 4 million people passing through um, the pasture and then just as we speak we're developing a new feature as well where you can put a QR code at the entry of where people are walking they can scan it and they will see the animals and the pastures that are within 20 kilometers, which will then give them the opportunity to avoid the livestock. Next thing we'll collar the public. Yes, yes, yeah. 
but the um, yeah the, the option to have a yeah so a, a, an information sign is the end to the land with a QR code they can scan and then that sends them to a website where they can see where the animals are on the piece of land they're about to move through. So if they want to go and see the animals, they can. If they don't, they can avoid those areas. And there's guess a, a scope in that to d indicate the paths they could use to avoid the animals because there's a really interesting piece around um, you know, dogs and wearing sheep at lambing time. And there's a couple of states that have put up sort of traffic light system. And if it's a red light, it means that your dog has to be on a lead. And actually, uh, an amber light means dog on lead. And a red light means don't walk here. And they indicate where the correct path is. So there's scope to use the tech to show the public how they can still enjoy the landscape, free of fences, so access isn't impeded, just find the right route to take. To say that the, um, the animals are virtually fenced in. Yes. So people realize they're not gonna to come to them, but if they let, let their dogs off, because yes. the animals obviously, if they're being chased, will come out of the virtual area. Yeah. And yeah. that's when the accident will happen. So question is, is there been a legal test to see whether you're being responsible putting a bull and a cow and calves in a field which has a footpath? I don't think this, none of this is around changing what's already good practice and good advice on public access where there's cattle grazing. So we're not looking to re readjust or change the rules there. Hey, look at that. He's down there, a big forest. Cool. Well, yeah. let's, I'll say what, let's wrap up there. We'll come and, and chat to you after, at the end of the session because yeah. uh, I'm conscious some people have got homes to go to or a bar to go and find. Um, thank you all for attending. If you're interested in, um, yeah, in, in trying it, then, um, then chat to the guys at the back or come and grab us afterwards. Thank you.